What do you suppose the church in Harrison will be like in 50 years? What will the church here in Harrison be whenever the leadership of this congregation is in the hands of our grandchildren? In Judges chapter 2, we have one of the most sad scriptures, in my opinion, because it shows where one generation forgets to pass the truths of God and fails to tell the next generation about the goodness of God and what He has done for them. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 6 it says, When Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. So this generation was the generation that were the eyewitnesses generation. They had seen firsthand with their own eyes all the glories that God had done among them through Moses and Joshua. Then Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance at Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaish. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And then this sad statement. And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which He had done for Israel. Whose fault is it, was it, that they didn't know it? Wasn't it the eyewitness generation's fault? The ones who had been there and had seen the glories that God had done, but yet had not passed this information, these truths, these laws of God, the importance of knowing Him and obeying Him to the next generation. They had not heeded Moses' warning in Deuteronomy 6 when he told the people in his last sermons or his last instructions to God's people, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Now notice here in in yellow. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep His statutes and His commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Moses said, you have got to pass on your faith to the next generation. You've got to tell them the things that God has done so they'll know. Verses 6 and 7 of Deuteronomy 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Brothers and sisters, it is important that we are good stewards of the truth that God has given us. And that we not only possess it and obey it and know it ourselves, but that we pass it on to the next generation. And I believe that knowing man's tendency to be led astray, Jude in his book, in his letter, in his epistle, felt compelled to write that they contend earnestly for the faith. Because it is man's nature at times to be gullible. And if we are gullible and we lose the truths of God, then God help the next generation. Jude has given us in this book that we've studied today, beginning this morning, a list of those who fell into disobedience. We're going to look at a few of these tonight. 
The Israelites are offered as, as an example. Even angels are offered as examples of those who, who didn't finish strong. Sodom and Gomorrah and their corruption. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. They're offered as those who fell into disobedience. We find language very similar to verse 5 and verse 17. Let's go to the next slide. In 2 Peter, is a very similar kind of thing. And in 1 Peter as well. Now I desire to remind you, remember when we did the lessons on the importance of remembering? If we don't remember to pass it on, if we don't remember the things ourselves and then to teach them to our children, then our children are more vulnerable than we are to false teaching. If they aren't equipped, then they are more vulnerable than we Now I desire to remind you, though you know all these things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. That was the next generation that came along that didn't believe. Verse 17, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to remember. It's important to remember. Not only for the longevity of our own faith, but so that we can tell these things to our children and remind them about it. Oh, I wish I even myself did a better job of having the words of Christ on my lips more often in my daily life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, you may have thought of this when I read verses 5 and 17 of Jude. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. How many years were they in the wilderness? Forty. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings to us. So will we learn from the mistakes of the Israelites? Will we learn from them and realize that a generation from now things could be a lot worse unless we pass on the truths of God's word to the next generation? These warnings are given to us and written down for us as examples for us. That's the reason that they're there. And so as Jude opens his letter, he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you about appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Ah, don't overlook the word earnestly. Because the word earnestly puts into this sentence a certain amount of urgency and energy that is lost if it isn't there. And so if we simply simply say, I'm appealing that you contend for the faith, that's a good statement. But to contend earnestly for the faith shows this is, is a fight. It is something we are at war against. And those soldiers who are asleep are vulnerable to attack. In Jude chapter 1 in verse 4, or Jude 4, we looked at this particular slide this morning. Those who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. The New Revised says, who pervert the grace of God into licentiousness. Or Barclay, who twist the grace of God into a justification of blatant immorality and who deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, those who would rename and justify and normalize sin. Do we ever see any of that in our culture? Renaming, justifying, and normalizing sin? We do. Now with this introduction, and you seeing how important this little warning book is written by Jude, the brother of Jesus, let's re- reread the book again tonight. So if you'll turn to Jude chapter 1, we'll read it together. (laughs) 
Does anybody close by me have a New International Version close by me here? Anybody? Can I use it for just a moment? I read from the New American Standard Bible this, this morning, so I thought maybe just for a difference I'll read from the NIV tonight. Book of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called and are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that God has once for all entrusted to the saints. Now let's pause there for a moment. Don't you like the word that's given here in the NIV? Entrusted. There's a responsibility that's been given to us to be stewards of the truth and of God's word. Verse 4. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered His people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandon their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They've taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Their waves of the sea foaming up their shame, Wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of His holy ones to judge everyone and to convict, convict all the ungodly of their ungodly acts that they have done in their ungodly way. And of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. These men are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God and our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's look at three of these different 
people who are mentioned here as examples of disobedience. Those serve as examples to us of things, characteristics we are to avoid. Cain, Korah, and Balaam. Cain, who was dominated by anger. Korah, who was dominated by pride. And Balaam, who was dominated by greed. These three vices, anger, pride, and greed, are certainly vices for all time. I guess all of us from time being human beings at times has to deal with anger, with our pride, and with greed. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4 as we consider Cain then. Cain. The way of Cain. By the way, um, where did Joan Campbell end up? Where is she sitting? Right there. Good to have you tonight. Glad you're doing well. Um, Don, good to have you back after being in the hospital this week too. Genesis 4. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering But for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. And so Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now let's stop here for a moment. I've always kind of, from this reading, kind of felt sorry for Cain. Said, well, they both both brought stuff. And, uh, you know, Cain was a worker of the ground, so he brought things from the ground. And Abel was a shepherd, so he brought things uh, from his flock. It seems kind of like a normal thing to happen. But we have to read between the lines here a little bit because there has to be more to the story than what we read here. Because God was displeased. And God wouldn't be displeased with something. In fact, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, it says Abel's offering was offered in faith. So perhaps Cain's was not offered in faith. One person was kind of pointing out it's kind of a subtle difference but that Abel was, was, uh, it says, brought from the firstlings or the first fruits of his flock. And for Cain, it just simply says he brought an offering. Um, perhaps there was in Cain's um, heart a less than full devotion to God and the offering, therefore, was displeasing. But whatever the reason it was, we find that God is displeased with Cain's offering but has regard for Abel's. Now notice what it says here in verse 5. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now be careful because very angry is usually not very good. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well... Sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Well, what has changed in the past thousands of years since the first man and woman and family? Here we find that Satan is there at the door. He's crouching. He's looking for any kind of opportunity. And anger presents itself as the perfect opportunity for Satan to wield himself. Verse 8, And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So here even in this first family, 
we find that faithfulness to God is not passed to every person in the next generation. Here is Cain, who is overcome, who is dominated by his own anger. Let's go next now to Numbers chapter 16 and look at Korah. Numbers 16. If you remember your, uh, your Bible history and uh, have studied this in Bible class, you'll remember that those who carried the poles and the tents and all the, the different furniture that was a part of uh, the tabernacle were from what tribe? They were, they were from Levi. They were, they were the Levites. And so they already held a, a certain a special place in the service of, of God's work in that they had this special closeness to the tabernacle and service in the tabernacle. Well, one of these uh, leaders in the, uh, Le- in the tribe of Levi was Korah. But there is something that Korah could not do because he was not from Aaron's line. And what was that? Couldn't be a priest. Now let's read from Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. Now Korah the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, from Dathan, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took action. They rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone too far, this is enough. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them is the Lord in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And when Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke with Korah and all of his company and said, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is His and who is holy and who will bring Him near to Himself. Even the one whom He will choose, He will bring near to Himself. Do this, take censers for yourself, Korah and your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You've gone too far, and, uh, you've gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to Himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And that He has brought you near, Korah, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Go now to chapter 26 of Numbers. Numbers 26. Beginning in verse 8, reading through 10. Uh, We can begin in verse 9. The sons of Eliab... Nemuel and Dathan and Abiram, these are Dathan and Abiram who were called by the congregation who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the, in the company of Korah when they contended against the Lord. Verse 10, And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with Korah when that company died and the fire devoured 250 men so that they became a warning. Kor then serves as an example of pride. It wasn't enough that he had a special position close to God, but his pride dominated him all the more. The last one we'll look at is in Numbers 22, if you'll turn your Bibles there. Numbers 22, and that's Balaam. I'm going to check something here in Jude. (coughs) 
The New American Standard Bible says that they had rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. I believe the NIV says rushed for profit, doesn't it say? Rushed for profit into the way or the error of, of, uh, of Balaam. Whenever you read here in Numbers chapter 22, you don't necessarily get the picture that Balaam was a greedy person. In fact, he sounds pretty righteous the way that uh, the events unfold here in Numbers 22. How that he was asked to, 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 by Balak to, um, to present a curse upon God's people. And he was unwilling to do that. Let's just read verses 18 through 23 then. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything either small or great contrary to the command of the Lord my God. And now please you also stay here tonight and I will find out what else the Lord will speak to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now this is where he has the encounter with the donkey that talks to him. But I want you to see here that we get a sense more of, of what's maybe at the heart of Balaam by seeing God's response to him going. God had given him permission to go, but he was angry because he was going. Verse 32, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. So this might be a little confusing until we get to Jude. And Jude says that there's an error here in Balaam's thinking. He was driven or dominated by his own greed. So here they are, the, these three different examples given of godlessness. Cain dominated by anger, Korah dominated by pride, and Balaam dominated by greed. Now let's get to the good stuff, the good news. How do we stand strong? We'll go through this quickly because we're at 10 till. How do we stand strong? Jude ends his letter on a positive note. He ends his, his letter by saying, you can be faithful. And all of these examples that I put forward of those who did not pass their faith on, those who, who let uh, the ball uh, roll away and, and didn't pass their faith on. And here they are, how to stand strong, number one. Fortify yourself. Notice these ideas. Verse 20, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Verse 20, pray in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, keep yourselves in God's love. There is a certain effort that we must put forth as God's people to fortify ourselves, to make ourselves resilient and strong. Secondly, help others be strong. Now this was last week's lesson, if you remember, from, um, from James, the end of James. Help others to be strong. Verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt. Verse 23, snatch or rescue some from the fire. And also in verse 23, while helping yourself, watch yourself that you too are not carried away. In fact, here are the exact words he uses. Have mercy on some who doubt. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. Each person requires perhaps a different response or a different rescue attempt. Some are beginning, they're, they're doubting and we can help them to have more faith. Others are, 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 completely, are completely gone and, and they need someone to come and rescue them. And some would need to mix mercy and fear. Number three. How to stand strong, rely upon God's promises. 
Here's verses 24 and 25. This is amazing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Listen, this is one of those put on your refrigerator verses. This is an amazing statement. Don't leave, if you leave with, and forget everything else, don't forget this one. This is a wonderful passage. Can you imagine what a blessing it is for us brothers and sisters to be able to stand in the presence of His glory, blameless and with joy. We don't stand blameless because we're perfect. We stand blameless because He is able. (laughs) Wow. We have something really special, brothers and sisters. Because if you're like me, you don't feel always blameless because you know your own mistakes and sins. But God is able to take away those sins through the blood of Jesus. And that we can stand in His glory. Not ashamed. But blameless and with great joy. Ah, don't miss the blessing. The warning is there given by Jude for a reason. It's so that we will rely upon God who is able to make us stand in His presence, blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. What a great promise. We stand because God is able to make us stand. We stand because He alone can make us stand in His presence, blameless and with great joy. And we stand because God is greater than anything that can pull us down. I want you to leave here encouraged tonight that God is able to forgive you and to make you blameless. And to leave here with a renewed vigor to be faithful to Him. God wants us to stand. God can help us to stand. We must strengthen ourselves, help one another, and rely upon God's promise. Now knowing man's tendency to be led astray, Jude felt compelled to write that they contend earnestly for the faith. Scrutinize the teachings, brothers and sisters, of all men in the perfect light of Scripture. It's our responsibility to pass a pure faith on to the next generation. And beware the motivations that often derail us, anger, pride, and greed. Fortify yourself, rescue others, believe in God's promises. And so I end with this question. Will the next generation be prepared to to contend for the faith? Only if we pass it on to them. Let's be diligent in our desire to pass on the words of life. If you'd like to respond tonight, this is the Lord's invitation. All of us where we stand, let's stand together and say, we will contend for the faith. Will you come as we stand and sing?